Senator from the Hollywood Reporter, and we are very fortunate tonight to have with us someone who was responsible 36 years ago for Top Gun, and is again uh, for Maverick. And so uh, I'll just note that Playboy has called him the most successful producer in history. Variety said he's the only man in the business today to become famous strictly as a producer. And the New York Times said he could very well be the most influential producer working today. And just to give you a quick reminder of why they might be saying that, Flash Dance, Beverly Hills Cop, Bad Boys, The Rock, Armageddon, Pearl Harbor, Black Hawk Down, Pirates of the Caribbean, National Treasure, so much of the TV that you watch and love, and the list goes on. And then, of course, this great sort of bookends of, uh, of the Top Gun franchise. So we'll get into a lot of this. Would you please join me in welcoming Jerry Brunheimer. Tony proceeded to pet his dog during the entire meeting that we had. 
And Don, who was a great salesman and could talk anybody's leg off, proceeds to tell the story of Top Gun. But when we walked out, that wasn't the movie we ended up making. He made up something <laughs> was very entertaining. And Ned turned to us and said, great, but I'm relying on you guys because I don't know what Tony can do. All I can do is pet my dog. <laughs> <laughs> and he asked us, what do you, what's this movie going to cost? And we said $14 million. And he said, go make it. It was that easy. And as the movie was coming together, the original, was it clear that something special was going on, or did you guys have to see a finished cut to know that? Well, it was special for us because we loved the material. We loved the screenplay. We loved what Tony was doing. And we had a terrific team and a fabulous head of the cinematographer. And we had the song, the theme, we had written by Harold Faulkner before we started the movie, which was really unusual. We sent him the script and he wrote that one the top of the thing. So we had the music was special. I mean, the team was special, but you never know if the movie was special. When we previewed in Houston, it was right after the shuttle disaster. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't a sound in the audience. There was no laughter. There was nothing. But when the cards came back, you could tell that the audience loved the movie. They just couldn't react to it because they were numb from, from all the tragedy that had happened around Houston. Tom Cruise today is known as a great, you know, enthusiastic pilot. At the time that you guys cast him in the original, that was not yet. I don't think he'd been flying. I know he was a, a big fan of the mission, but I'm not sure he even had the time. Because when we first met Tom, he had just finished Legend with Ridley Scott, and he has his long ponytail, and he drove a motorcycle. And we couldn't get him to commit to the film. He was interested, he was flirting with it. So I arranged for him to fly with Blue Angels. And he's now Central California. He took the flight, he landed. He goes to the payphone, you know, cell phones in those days, calls me up and says, I'm in. I'm doing it. This is fantastic. And that blew him away. But according to him, he was always going to do it. He was just stringing us along. <laughs> now, might, there, might there be another detail about how that flight went that uh, you're, you're leaving out, Jerry? He did throw up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so going into the opening weekend of that original, um, what did you kind of think best case scenario was? And then can you remind people uh, how it how it happened? You never know, at least I never know. I think you know as an audience if a movie's gonna be hit, because we really don't know. Anybody who tells you they made a hit movie's an audience here because they don't know. The collective audience knows what you've given them. So that opening weekend was Pretty good. It wasn't huge, but it was pretty good. I think it was. I think it was ET was the big movie that year. If I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. I think it was. That was a little earlier, but there was. But it. it I mean, it's interesting because both the original and this one have, even in the age of the blockbuster, where the opening weekend is supposedly everything, both have had just incredible legs. Right? It wasn't. It wasn't uh, a flash, and then they kind of faded. It was. Both times um, over a long period of time. Yeah, I played, I think, all summer. I played for a long time. But this one's really become a phenomenon because it played for 21 weeks in theaters. It was the number one Labor Memorial Day. It was number one Labor Day. That's right. It was the number one streamer at the same time as number one in the theaters. Mm -hmm. So, what mm -hmm. Top Gun has done for filmmakers, for theater owners, for actors, for anybody who works in our business, it shows what Hollywood can do, the magic of movies if you do it right. And with all the actors and craftsmen and all the people that work so hard at what we do, this is a reward to, to the audience. To the audience not only here but around the world. You have to understand that Top Gun was bigger foreign than it was domestic. And that's unbelievable. If you think about, it's really about our fighter pilots and our military community. And yet everybody loved the movie because they didn't see that. It was about the characters, it was about the emotion. It was about all the things that we worked so hard 
to capture, which was the reality of what these young men and women do when they join the military. And how it's a, char it's a character study of Tom, of Maverick, who comes into this movie alone, and how through the course of the movie he finds a family. It's a journey that he's been on for a long time. So the fact that Tom said, I'm not making this movie, unless Val Kilmer is in it. And Val came up with the idea for his character and his part, and they worked really hard. Chris McQuarrie and Joe Kaczynski worked so hard in that scene and did it a couple times to make sure they had it right. And that's one of the emotional hooks of the story. The same thing with, with Rooster and, and his journey through the movie. The same thing with Tom and the deal with Rooster and Jennifer Connelly. So it, it's about those actors and about the great writing and the performance and Joe directing it. And then all the little pieces that come together from the art direction, the production design, the costuming, everything has to be perfect to get this right. And somehow by the team that we all put together, it was embraced by the world. And that's what I'm so proud of. I'm so proud that we made a movie that captured a worldwide audience and gave two hours of entertainment and shows what we can do when we do things with care and intelligence for really talented people, which this town is full of. Now, military training, it's not a coincidence, is it, that so many of your movies we can go through, Pearl Harbor, or uh, any number of them, have had the military factor in in a major way. Obviously, both Top Guns. This doesn't just happen personally. It doesn't, it's not like an easy thing to get actual aircraft carriers and planes and all of that together, but you've, you've chosen to keep returning to that, right? Well, first of all, I... I really believe that to keep our country safe, you need a very strong military. You look what's going on in the Ukraine, you see what the bullies can do, unfortunately. So we want to have the best and the brightest to protect us all. And I really value that these young men and women sacrifice their lives to protect all of us. And I always want to tip my hat to them for what they've done for all of us. So the first time we made Top Gun, the military was really not in favor of making the picture. There was an admiral in, in North Island where, where the Top Gun School was at the time. And he didn't want us there. So Tom and I flew to Washington, met with the Secretary of Navy, John Lehman. And John understood what Hollywood could do for the military. And he said, here's my home phone number. If they give you any trouble, you call me. And the admiral was removed. And we made movies. <laughs> <laughs> now, they were cooperating with us, but it wasn't like this time. This time, it was carte blanche. They let us into everything and gave us anything we needed. And because well, nobody's there, ever made them look cooler than you. Yeah. 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 That's true. We were five hundred percent after the first movie came out. So it was good for them. And when we went to make this one, they were kind of. They were wounded. Only a third of their planes could operate. They didn't have parts for them because they took a lot of the military spending away. So they were just coming back from not having enough funding. So they really needed recruits and they needed people. So this was a boom for them also. So yeah. first one comes out in 86, and almost immediately people are saying, when's the sequel coming out? Let me read you a 1990 comment by Lily Dunsip, somebody mentioned. Um, asked about if Top Gun 2 was on your agenda. He said, no, Jerry and I have an agreement. We don't make sequels to our movies. We want to do fresh and better. He added, if Paramount has a Top Gun 2 in mind, I'm interested in buying a ticket to it because it certainly won't be starring Tom Cruise or produced by the guys who invented it. <laughs> <laughs> now, 32 years, a lot can happen, but talk about how you felt about uh, a sequel from early on, and just why it took, uh, or I should say, what am I saying, 32, 36 years. Uh, why did it take that long? Back in those days, sequels were always something that, for a studio for money grab, what they would do is they would take the original budget and cut it by 20%. and say, look, it, we know people are going to show up, so we have one or two weekends, that's great. So don't spend any money. We didn't want to make a movie that wasn't as good, if not better, than the first one. 
And then what happened is Tom went on and had this phenomenal career working with all these great actors and directors and writers. And we went on with our careers. So Top Gun kind of faded in, in the background. Joe Kaczynski, who we took to Paris to meet Tom five years ago, he was shooting Mission Impossible. Joe had come up with the idea of, of Rooster and Rooster is Goose's son. And we pitched it to Tom, and he had a book book of what the movies would look like. He had the name, Top Gun Maverick. And Tom looked at Joe and said, if we do this, we gotta do it for real. So Tom called the head of the studio of Paramount and said, I want to make another Top Gun. Of course, they put the baby. Literally, how quickly was the yes? It was automatic. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even ask how much it was going to cost, which is really unusual. Uh. <laughs> um, now, you mentioned Joe Kaczynski directing Top Gun Maverick. When you first were, um, when it was first actually starting to look like a real possibility, I was, I believe, maybe about a decade ago, Tony Scott, who directed the original and with whom you also did Beverly Hills Cop 2, Days of Thunder, uh, Crimson Tide, Enemy of the State, and Deja Vu, you were, you were off with him uh, kind of beginning to explore doing it at another time. Right? It's really kind of a sad story because it was a Friday and we flew with Tom to Fallon, Nevada, and Tony to scout locations and talk to the aviators and the top gun pilots. And unfortunately on Sunday we lost Tony, so it was really, really a sad, sad week. And Tony was really excited about making another top gun. But unfortunately we lost him. So Tom Cruise was obviously always going to be a part of any other top gun, but how did you what was the process of arriving at some of these other great folks who are now part of this ensemble was is it sort of like chemistry reads with Tom? How, how do you guys go about casting Miles and Jennifer and all these other people? Denise Chamion was the casting director that we worked with. And Joe's worked with a lot, and I worked with a lot. She gave hundreds and hundreds of tapes and interviews to Joe. And Joe selected a lot of his first choices and showed them to Tom and myself. And then we were interviewing him to talk to him. Now, what Tom told him was that this is not a normal acting job. You're going to have to really work hard to do this because you're going to have to be able to fly in these planes and you're going to have to train for three months. And we had training where they went in first on a prop plane, then they went into an aerobatic prop, then they went into a jet and finally an F-18. The reason for this is because you have to be able to withstand the G-forces. Even a, a, a an aviator, an experienced aviator, has to build up his G tolerance so they wouldn't throw up as much because all of them threw up no matter what. <laughs> Except for, for Monica. The female never flew. <laughs> so the the I guess first of all, where was where was the shot in fact in reality? It was shot here in California, it was shot in, in North Island, a lot of it was shot in Washington State, it was shot in Tahoe, and that's where most of the aerial stuff was done. But the picture itself was shot here in San Diego, really in, in North Island. And you guys get through, uh, a, 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 I imagine, a pretty grueling, you know, this is a, a big undertaking. Do you remember what, how many days and just anything approximately with that? With that? I couldn't tell you, it was a long, it was a long period we, because we broke it down into various sections. We did the ground story, then we had to do an air story, then we did a carrier story, so it was spread out quite a bit. Gets done, you guys date this for uh, June 2020 originally? <laughs> I think you're right. And uh, literally, it was on the first poster. There's one in your office, a giant one. June 2020, Top Gun Maverick. Um, when March 2020 happened. Um, what was, take me through your the evolution of your thought process about what to do with this movie. What, what did you, you know, there was no reopening of movie theaters on the horizon. Um, what do you do with a movie that this isn't, this was, you know, a lot of other movies were going straight to streaming or other things. Take me through your thought process about what to do with this. 
well, from the very beginning, we always thought this is a big theatrical movie. And we wanted to make sure that we had that opportunity to bring it to a big worldwide audience on a big screen, because that's how, the reason we made it and how we made it. And all the expertise and people who worked on it wanted to see on that huge screen you just saw it on. So we waited. We waited for two years until we felt the theaters were safe to people to come back to. And just what, I mean, you sort of alluded to this earlier, but, you know, there have been a couple of movies that people were coming back to, primarily young, really young audiences like Spider-Man, I think, were, uh, if you look at the numbers, really young. This is really the first movie to bring back people of all ages and just insane pre-pandemic like numbers. Um, why do you think, right out of the gate, was it that was the case? Because it was amazing. Well, <laughs> you don't know that until you've seen it, but I agree, yeah. So I'm wondering, you know, what do you think it's to some degree there's a whole who let me let me sorry to ramble on with the question, but I do think there's a something here that what other movie star other than Tom Cruise has ever starred in two movies that open at number one at the box office thirty six years apart? It's just, I, if you picture who today would open a movie at number one in 2058, right? <laughs> it's just unfathomable. So, yeah. I don't know, I can't tell you. All I know is we get up every morning, we work as hard as we can, we surround ourselves with really talented people, we work with great executives. And Tom is a force, Tom is somebody who cares so much about what he does and the people he surrounds himself with and puts so much energy and time. I mean, he lives on sets. He's been working on Mission Impossible right after he finished Top Gun. He's been doing that for two years. Going there. He's the happiest when he's on the set. And he cares about you. He cares about the audience. He wants to entertain audiences. That's why he makes movies. People may have noticed so first of all, let's say your, your, your partner who we mentioned earlier, Don, passed away in January 1996. We are now 26 years after that. And yet when people sit down and watch Top Gun, at the beginning, there is a produced by credit for Don Simpson in here as well. Um, it seems like a pretty lovely tribute. Uh, what, what, just anything you want to say about that and what he would have made for getting these uh, early reservations about a sequel, if he saw that this movie it was he existed and did as tremendously as it has, well, he was so responsible for the first one. I mean, he worked so hard in the screenplay. He was such a force. He actually sold it to Ned Cannon and told me he couldn't talk. Right. So he deserves the credit, and he lives with me always. He's always watching over us and giving us advice at least, uh, I feel it. So he, he was somebody that, kid from Alaska, who came to Hollywood and wanted to make it and worked his ass off, became head of the studio, and then joined me and we made a bunch of movies together. And again, he was somebody who cared about audiences and that's why I'm still doing it, because I love what I do, whether it's for television or streaming, as long as we can work with talented people and get the imagination of the audience going. That's the fun of it. The fun of it for me is to go opening weekend to the Chinese theater, which I did for Top Gun, stand in the back and watch all of you enjoy that movie. <laughs> That's the thrill of, of what you do. And when you do something and you do it right, thanks to all the great people that we work with and will continue to work with. And what I love is working with, with our actors. That's the joy. They're the ones who run the camera. They took off all the heat because their performances are so important to your enjoyment of the movie. We cast them right and we put the effort and the time in. And the fact that we have young actors who have nice careers, starting their careers, now they're worldwide stars. Everybody knows who our cast is now. So Tom took them under his wing and they talk almost every day and they say to him, Tom, how do I have a career like yours? In fact, I can tell you a story about Glenn Powell and how he got into the movie. Glenn wanted to have a producer part, and he didn't get one. I 
son was thought he'd be great for the part we gave him. Amen. And so we gave offered him a part. His agent called back and said he's not going to do it. He really wants the other part. So we called again. He, he said Tom would like to meet Glenn. And the agent said, okay. <laughs> but just know, don't be insulted. He's not doing anything. So Tom sat down with him and talked for a while and, and then said, I really want the career you have. And Tom said, don't pick the parts, pick the movie and make the part great. And that's what he did. And he doesn't have that issue anymore. <laughs> I'm going to do one last question for me, and then Sarah will close with about three from the audience and uh, then let you go. But final question, it's sort of the, uh, the obvious one. Could there be a Top Gun 3, <laughs> hopefully sooner than 36 years from now? Well, I won't be here at that time. Who knows? We're just enjoying this one and hopefully we continue to carry this one on for, for the rest of the year and then we'll figure out what happens next. All right. We'll come back to the front section in a moment. Let's give somebody in the back a chance. I see like a red colored yes. I'm in your class actually. Hey, great. All right. <laughs> Well, you have to have a great staff. We have fantastic people that we've had for years. I mean, our film department, I think we have three executives that have been with me for, I bet you, 20 years or longer. Television, the woman who was on my desk um, as an assistant is now the head of television. I bet you that was 15, 20 years ago. So we treat our, our people in our company really well, and they stay with us, and we have, you know, daily phone calls where I get updated. We have weekly development calls. I read everything that comes in as far as our TV and watch every every show. And the same thing in movies. I read all the scripts when they come in. And not the development stuff, but when you get close to making, I read everything. I just, it, I love it. So to me, it's fun. Please. What would you do with half a million dollar budget? <laughs> Depends on the concept. It's all about the concept. You can have something that you can make small, and if the words and the characters are strong enough, you don't need a lot of money. Final question. Um, Sir. I can't think of a bigger movie. I've seen it three times. Those fighter jets flying over the premier icon that was right under them. I can't think of a bigger movie, but the most moving moment in the entire film for me was when they were staring down the targeting system of the enemy uh, fighter jet. And uh, Maverick says, I'm sorry, Goose, not I'm sorry, Wooster. So I'm curious, how, how, did, how involved are you in script development and story development to have those human moments in such massive films that you make time and time again? That's our writers, and it really is. We just had so many terrific writers work on this. You know, I was in all the story meetings with Tom and with uh, Chris and Corey and, and with uh, Joe Kaczynski. So we worked and worked and worked at this and kept rewriting it, making it better and making it better. And we looked at the footage and said, we have to fix this, we have to add this, and Chris was always writing. Our poor actors would get pages the morning they showed up <laughs> because of changes we thought we could make it better after we saw the previous day. Jerry Ruckheimer, thank you so much for coming.